This video is sponsored by Milk Chemistry. Check them out and click the link below for 25% off. We are now on the ninth video since the reset of our channel and have advanced through a variety of early technologies humanity learned to master through the Stone Age. My results haven't always been the greatest, but so far in the past 11 weeks, we've covered technologies that took humanity some 190,000 years to learn and master. But next up, we are reaching one of the early major milestones in history that helped greatly accelerate humanity's development, the Bronze Age. The ability to craft and cast this durable metal alloy and create significantly better tools and weapons is so crucial, I wasn't willing to commit to this channel reset until I knew there was a path for me to make it to the Bronze Age myself. Up to this point, I've had the historically rare advantage of being able to source and use native copper, conveniently with the largest deposit of such metals in the world relatively close by. However, the majority of the world didn't have this large access to metal straight out of the ground. And to get to the stage of extracting metals from ore compounds took some significant technological developments before its secret could be unlocked. To unlock the secret myself, and learn the science and skill behind copper smelting, turning copper ore into copper metal, I paid a visit to the Butzer Archaeological Farm in the UK last spring to learn from their resident copper smelting expert, James Cliff. This process that we're using at the moment with the propane in antiquity would have been done in a bowl furnace in the ground with a toya, which is the air supply, pointing down from a set of bellows and run for about 24 hours with layers of malachite and layers of charcoal and you would have ended up with a bloom in the bottom of the furnace but this is a much quicker process so what we're doing is the same thing but quicker. Due to his asthma he uses a modern propane kiln to assist in the process but the base concept will be the same when I attempt this later myself more primitively. They do it in in a large quantity. Uh -huh. So the, the, the bowl furnace would have been about the same size as a five gallon bucket. The tin has to be crushed down into a powder, separated from the calcite that way, and then smelted in the same way. The malachite, that's copper ore. So okay. we're, gonna, we're gonna do some alchemy today. They would have done a layer, same as we're doing, a layer of charcoal, layer of malachite, layer of charcoal. Is it just malachite ore that they would use, or do they ever use other forms of copper ore? Um, I've got some other copper ore, but no, because it's too complicated to get it out. Can't let you have the cassiterite though, because that's rare as hen's teeth. Have you done this before? Not smelting, I've done casting. Yeah, well, it must have been very labor intensive. But they had a power tool that we, we can't afford. That's time. <laughs> and slaves, of course. You ready? It's like the surface of the sun. As I said last time I did it, it was molten and it just ran everywhere and I just lost it all. So. That's copper and these are bits of copper here. Yeah. Just let them cool. I think we've been successful. Next he demonstrated how to cast the copper we just smelted into a replica of Otzi, the mummified Iceman's axe. My hammer. Did you cast these? Yeah. Nice. That was a surprise when they found him in the 90s. He was 6, 000, five or 6,000 years old. People didn't think we'd got copper then. So I'm gonna feed it from that end. So we'll pop it in there like that. And it's got to be Johnson's. Nothing else works properly. Wood ash, wood ash will work. My late father's shaving brush. Oh, we just fill him up again then. How'd you get on driving on the wrong side of the road then? <laughs> that is then a challenge. <laughs> 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 the hardest part is remembering to get on the right side of the car when I get in. <laughs> Good. So this is going to be the pouring cup. We just smelted some copper, so that makes me an alchemist. Yeah. Nice. That's the size of Otis? Yes. Oh. So it's an exact replica. Oh. It's like it's 
that it was quite advanced because it's got flanges. Yeah. A lot of the early axes in this country were just flat. Hmm. So they'd slide about in the haft. Try explaining that to customs. <laughs> Thanks to James, I now know the process of smelting copper, which historically puts me around 5000 BCE, when it's believed the process of smelting and casting copper from ore was first discovered, bringing in a transitional era called the Calcolithic or Copper Age in some parts of the world. And this was the era Otzi the Iceman lived in. These advancements in metallurgy at this time are likely in part thanks to the agricultural revolution which began as early as 10,000 BCE when humanity started to transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary farming. In our next video we'll cover this a bit more in depth as I attempt to invent bread. This change to settled agriculture allowed the eventual development of cities and civilizations and with it more complex trade routes and trading of knowledge that facilitated more and more advanced metallurgy. Eventually, it was discovered additional metals mixed or alloyed with copper would yield even stronger metals. Initially with arsenic and a few other metals, but thanks to the development of wide trade routes, it was soon discovered that the combination of tin with copper, two metals that are rarely found near each other, would together form an even better alloy. Some evidence suggests this happened potentially as early as 4500 BCE. The Bronze Age happened at different times in different parts of the world, and in some areas it was completely skipped over. The widespread use of bronze in the official start of the Bronze Age is considered to be around 3300 BCE in the Near East with the early civilization of Sumer. This next period of humanity set the stage for many significant technological advancements we'll be exploring soon, such as the invention of writing, mathematics, astronomy, and even the wheel. But first, I need to enter the Bronze Age myself. I previously explored both areas with tin ore in Cornwall and copper ore in California, although both have been extensively mined at this point to exhaustion. It's Hen's teeth. As many areas of the world have. So sources of high-grade malachite and cassiterite that were once plentiful 6,000 years ago are now pretty rare. So I'll need to supplement my supply thanks to the help of one of our subscribers, Samuel Thompson. Now to smelt and cast my metals. Using only the technologies I've developed so far. First off, let's go through some materials and tools I've unlocked in previous videos that'll be useful for this. Just recently, I learned how to start fire using primitive methods, the digging stick I cut and shaped using some stone flint tools, clay collected and processed with the help of said stick, my native copper axe made from raw copper metal we sourced in Michigan, bamboo stalks I previously collected from a forest in California, as well as cordage spun from harvested wild hemp. The big hurdle with copper and bronze will be reaching the high smelting and melting temperatures needed. Previously, I explored smelting and casting lead, a metal that predates bronze and has a low enough temperature that a standard campfire could be used. Copper, however, will require some optimization of fire to achieve the necessary temperatures. First, charcoal. Charcoal is basically partially burned wood. While burning wood while sealing it in an enclosed space, it'll burn without oxygen and only burn off initial materials and moisture leaving behind charred carbon that won't burn without the oxygen. This carbon is what burns the most efficiently and at the highest temperature, giving a very effective fuel. But to best maximize heat, you also want to maximize the other side of the fire triangle, oxygen. This can be done by forcing air into the fire, providing additional oxygen for combustion. Later in history, different forms of bellows would be invented, but it's believed copper smelting was first done just using blowpipes and human lungs. So using the bamboo I've previously harvested and at least worked on turning them into blowpipes. Since bamboo isn't actually hollow, each of these nodes is actually sealed inside, I'm gonna have to break them. And to do that, I'm gonna take this piece of smaller bamboo that fits inside and I'm gonna sharpen the end of it so I can use it to force it through and break the nodes so we actually have a hollow pipe that we can use as a blowpipe. Bamboo is really prone to splitting anyways and when you force something through the inside of it, it really wants to split like that. To fix that, I'm just gonna take some pine resin later and I will fill it in the cracks and then that'll work as a glue to hold the sides together and make it back into an airtight tube. Next, we tested the combination to see what kind of temperature we would be able to get with a combination of charcoal and blowpipes. Within a short time, we were able to get the coals to just over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, just hot enough to smelt and melt copper. However, sustaining that rate of airflow in that temperature for long enough to melt something 
would be a bit of a challenge. Historically, in depictions of Egyptian smelting, they depict up to six people on bellows. Unfortunately, we don't have the advantage they had in the past of, as James said, time and slaves. And slaves, of course. So we're measuring out the max wind speed we can produce together using an an. An using an anemometer so we can make an equivalent substitution and avoid any questionable ethical complications. Thank you today's sponsor, Milk Chemistry. Today's video is all about metal. If you want to learn more about the science behind metals and physical properties that make up the world, check them out. That's Milk Chemistry. They have a variety of different kits here covering different types of metals from tin to iron, even the crystals like malachite that make copper. It's a really fun, affordable way to get into science. Great way to explore it yourself or with your kids or with your niece or nephews. So check them out in the link below and get 25% off using the promo code. The next challenge now will be a container that can withstand the high heat and hold the molten metal allowed to be picked up and poured into a mold. We've collected clay from a few different areas that would each have a unique composition and tried out a variety of crucibles to get something that this might work. This is really good clay. Yeah. It's the best clay I've ever seen straight out of the ground. Many broken crucibles later, we had some good candidates. Now to smelt some metals. All right, so I have the malachite already crushed up. This is uh, courtesy of Samuel Thompson. So with it, I need to mix charcoal to add some carbon. And as I learned in Butzer, this acts as a reducing agent, kind of attaches itself to any oxygen that gets released and forms carbon dioxide, preventing it from attaching to the copper as it gets broken down and that allows just the pure copper to form in little prills. So then pick out and then melt down and cast that. So then I just sprinkle it on, then add alternating layers of more charcoal to act as a reducing agent, and then just blow into it for about an hour or so. I'm gonna try putting the cover on top to help seal in and trap the heat, keep it contained. Just likely add charcoal as we go. And hopefully when it's all done, we can collect some little prills of copper at the bottom, collect enough of them and you can cast something. Oh, look at that. That is definitely metal. There's some more. I know that is definitely copper. Looks copper colored. It's definitely metal. Looks like a success. Got a container to hold all this. It's very pretty. Got a nice rainbow patina on it, I can see. What is that? That might be leftover malachite. Might have been too big. Ow. Big boy. Big one. That's very hot. <laughs> wow. That's a nice color. It's weird that it kind of retained the shape of the rock. All right, so I think I've gotten the majority of the copper. It looks like a lot of it has reacted. A few different phases it seems to be in. Some of it's kind of like a rock shaped and pretty crumbly. It looks like copper. It has patina on it like copper. My suspicion is that it got hot enough to convert it and reduce it, but it didn't get hot enough to actually melt and form into a bead. We do have a few different beads in here or prills where it obviously melted. And there's one of the bigger ones. It actually worked. I don't know why I'm surprised. It's the exact same process I did. we did in uh, England. To actually do it over a charcoal kiln, something this simple, it's actually kind of surprising. I'm just gonna keep picking through and get everything that I can, then process the rest of the malachite. Then we'll do the exact same process for tin, and we can uh, cast something in bronze. So next up, I'm gonna make the tin. So we have a few pieces of cassiterite, basically the same process as the copper. I'm gonna put this in with a few layers of charcoal to help reduce it. Check on the tin. Looks like I might have some pearls here. So it could be metal. I think the outside of it should oxidize white. So that looks pretty promising. All right, so I got the copper and tin pearls in here. Ready to melt it down in this little crucible. Hopefully it doesn't crack. And cast it into this mold.
Getting the bronze fully melted took several attempts with small batches, and even then it proved to be difficult to get it to cast before it would cool and solidify. Ah. Yeah, I like sparkles. For molds for the casting, I tried using dried clay, but we quickly learned that they still contained too much water that would cause some less than ideal results. I then switched to using sand for the mold. What a beautiful board. My attempts at rivets didn't work out, so I attempted to redrill the holes using the bow drill I used to create fire and one of the copper arrowheads, but eventually gave up and moved back to using the pine pitch beeswax and charcoal glue to bind it with some of our cordage on top. All right, so with these two items, I am now officially entering the Bronze Age. I'm finding that I have to kind of relearn everything now with the new variables of doing it more primitively. So it's still a learning process. So while these are both are pretty rough, they are still effective tools to be useful for making future things. And as bronze are a lot harder and are already a step up from anything I already have. The native copper tools were a lot more effective than I actually expected. It actually holds an edge pretty well, but it does dull super quickly. And I have to spend a lot of time resharpening this as I go. It makes it a bit slow. The bronze should be a lot better. And it's a lot harder, it's alloyed, should be able to produce a much stronger cutting edge that holds the edge a little bit longer. However, compared to more modern steel, they're still gonna be comparably soft. And it's gonna take a long time to actually get to that level of quality of steel. Even when I first get into the Iron Age, it's likely it's not even gonna be as good as bronze in the beginning. And it's gonna take a lot of refining to even match it. And then many centuries of progress to get to the level of hardened steel that we have today. To a modern person, these are not that great. But to someone in the Bronze Age, this is cutting edge technology. Can't get much better than that. This is gonna open a lot of possibilities for making tools, both with the harder metal, but also being able to cast it into custom shapes. Something that I was very limited with on the native copper. So for our next episodes, we'll be producing a variety of different tools to help us make more and more things as we progress into the Bronze Age. Something I find really interesting about the Bronze Age is that metallurgy for making bronze is pretty complex and was a bit difficult to figure out. But actually mastering this took place before a lot of other inventions that seem more common sense, things like paper, glass, written language, 
the wheel. These are all things that came after bronze and are future topics we're gonna be exploring. Entering into the Bronze Age really opens up the world into actual civilization and the evolution of society as a whole. So we'll be exploring some really interesting topics as we continue. So to make these two things, it took about 36 hours of labor to smelt the copper and the tin and then cast everything together into the molds and get some workable results which I then had to finish. So it's about 36 hours. That's about $264 for both of these items. But these are based off of the evolving technology I've been working on. The whole process to get to here was 164 hours, which at about today's minimum wage would be about $1,300. So one Bronze Age for just $1,300. Just put that on the Amex. Next up, we're gonna explore a little bit more of the agricultural revolution and the invention of bread. For some bread I grew myself, I'm gonna make my own oven, as well as tools to get harvested and milled. Then after that, we'll be producing a variety of different tools, specifically with woodworking in mind, and uh, keep moving on through the Bronze Age. Lastly, thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. If you enjoy our content and wanna see us keep going onto the Iron Age and beyond, please consider supporting us. Any amount really helps. Otherwise, thank you for watching and thanks for your support. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.